The play A Doll's House by Enric Ibsen provides a perfect opportunity to explore the themes of freedom and confinement. Here's a picture of Ibsen, a playwright from Norway. And uh, a, doll a Doll's House is probably his most famous play. And in this play, if you look at the characters, it's basically the story of a relationship between a husband and wife. The wife's name is Nora Helmer. She's the main character of the play, and she's married to Torvald Helmer. So when we think about freedom and confinement, we're going to look at that and see how it applies to their relationship. And we're also going to look at the relationship between a friend of Nora's, uh, Miss Christine Lind, and uh, then, and then a person who is a friend of Christine's. He was a friend of Torvald and he works for Torvald Helmer and his name is Niles Krogstad. So we're gonna look at how the themes of freedom and confinement uh, apply to that other relationship, Mrs. Lind and Niles Krogstad. And then there's this character, it's kind of sometimes difficult to understand what his role is in the play. We're wondering like, what is he doing there? He seems to be just kind of caught in the middle and his name is Dr. Rank. So those are basically the five, that's really the only five characters to know from the, from the story, the two relationships, Torvald and Nora Helmer, and then Mrs. Lind and Niles Krogstad with Dr. Rank in the middle. We have some minor characters. We see the three children and the nurse, the child's nurse, the children's nurse, who was also Nora's nurse when she was younger. Then there's a housemaid and a porter, okay? So very few uh, characters and most of the, almost all the, all the action of the play takes place in the home of the Helmers. And uh, we need to see here that the home is sort of an upper middle class home. It's furnished comfortably and tastefully, but not extravagantly. So this is a middle class, upper middle class family. They're on the rise and uh, Torvald is trying to rise up in his status in society. And we're gonna see this society in this play as, uh, in, in, as a, where, where the reputation is very important to Torvald. Your, the way your outer image, the way that you're perceived by others seems to be very important in this society. Social conformity, following social conventions, fitting in and looking good in the eyes of society seems very important. And so this is, uh, and then we see that we're, that the setting is it's Christmas time at the home, okay? So we're gonna start with drama and think about the plot. And remember that we start with the rising action. And then we have a falling action like, a, uh, like a, a, the upside down letter V, a rising action, we get to a peak, which is the climax or turning point, and then a falling action. And then before that rising and, and falling, before and after, you've got two other parts of a play. So before the rising action, we have what's called the exposition. This is the part where we're exposed to, or we just start to get to know the characters uh, get settled into the setting of the play and figure out what is going on. So if you recall from uh, um, the play, um, if you look at um, the, the play uh, uh, Raisin in the Sun, right? We had the exposition when we were uh, getting to know the family and then we find out that the check is coming and they start to have a conflict over what to do with the money. And then we get the exposition in um, Antigone where we get the sense that there's been this edict by the king and you're not supposed to go and help and, and uh, bury the, the dead of the traitor, the, the, the dead body of the traitor. Um, and the young sisters are debating over that and Antigone decides to violate the edict to go against it and do follow her own conscience and do what is right. So the exposition here is we're getting to know all of the characters, figuring out the setting, and then we're gonna get to what's called the enticing uh, action, the incite, I'm sorry, not enticing, the inciting action. So the, the, the crisis or inciting action is something that's gonna happen here in act one, that's going to start all of the conflict going, and then that conflict will continue right up to that turning point, okay? So before that upside down V, the rising and falling action, we have the exposition. And then after the falling action, 
we have a sort of a resolution or conclusion to the play, which is called the uh, resolution or denouement. Okay, so think about the shape of a plot. And let's dig in now with the exposition. And we see the setting here in this nice home at Christmas time. And now we're introduced to the relationship between Nora and Torvald. And we can see right off that something's not quite right. He treats, treats her like a little child and he has all these kind of creepy pet names for her, right? So she comes in and she takes a, she's got a, a little packet of macaroons and she takes a little bo a secret bite like she's not allowed to. It's against the rules to eat this cookie. And so she eats it really quickly, almost like she's a little girl instead of being the mother. And notice you can keep track, keep a scorecard of all the creepy uh, and everything he calls her, it's always a little something. So is that my little lark, little lark, little skylark? That's something he calls her. Is that my little squirrel bustling about? So you can just start thinking, marking, like you said, keep score. Uh, my little spendthrift, has she been wasting money again? And so you can see how he treats her like a little girl. And you can kind of get a sense of the title, a doll's house. He treats her like a doll. And he thinks she's kind of running around spending too much money. And she's like, oh, don't worry. We can always borrow the money if we need it. And he calls her a little featherhead, like that's like an airhead, you know, basically calling her a stupid young woman, right? You little featherhead. And notice we can look at that lens, the feminism lens, the gender lens, and see the way that she's treated. How does society, and specifically uh, Torvald, how does he treat women here? He treats her like an object, like a toy. And he says, that's like a woman. But he says, look, he shows that he is very much against borrowing. I don't want any debt and no borrowing. We're gonna see that this is foreshadowing. This is giving clues about what's gonna come up later in the play. It's very important for us to understand that Helmer looks down on borrowing and debt. He thinks it's a terrible, terrible thing. Knowing that is gonna make some things very clear later on in the play. So we really have to pay attention to what people say in drama because all of the play, uh, all of the, the, the um, narrative is coming through the, what's being spoken. So pay attention to their words we have kept bravely on the straight road so far, okay? So Helmer says, I really look down on borrowing and debt. I don't wanna do it. He gives her some money and he says, do you think I don't know what a lot is, is wanted for housekeeping at Christmas time? Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's like she has to get an allowance she has to beg permission from her husband to get some of this money, like getting an allowance. And we're gonna, we find out later why the money is important to her. It's not what we think at, about, think at first, okay? Here's a quick, uh, they don't come in too often, but here's a quick glimpse of the three kids, Ivar, Bob, and Emmy. Helmer calls her an extravagant little person. Calls her constantly, my dear little Nora. And Nora says, smiling quietly and happily, you haven't any idea how many expenses we scar -like, Skylarks and squirrels have, Torvald. All right, so now what we're trying to pick up on is there's some type of secret here. She's smiling and happy about something, but we quite don't quite know what it is. And so she gives us a little glimpse here by saying, look, you guys don't have any idea of what my expenses are. And he calls her odd little soul there. And then Miss Sweet Tooth. Okay. So in the exposition, we're really getting an understanding of the nature of this relationship. He's like a grown up. She's like a little child. She's like a doll. And so this doll's house is probably referring to this house. She's probably like the doll in this house. It's not a real house in a sense. Now, uh, Nora's also excited because Helmer's getting a, a, a promotion at the bank, a raise, and they're having a lot of money coming in. 
and Nora is talking about how wonderful this is to have all this money. Now we're gonna see, she's not just being greedy, we're gonna see about why she's happy about money because she's been under a monetary burden for a while now, and this burden is about to be lifted. And so she's feeling excited about this. She's anticipating this. He says, it's good that our hard times are over. And she says, yes, it's really wonderful, all right? So that's the first part of the exposition. We get to know Helmer, uh, we can also call him by his first name, Tor, Torvald and Nora Helmer, right? Now the next part of our exposition, we're introduced into another, a third major character, and that's Mrs. Lind. And notice that she's not as happy. She has a dejected and timid voice. And this is a woman who is single. She, her husband has died. She has no kids. And she's coming into town. She drops by to see Christine, an old friend, and then finds out uh, that there's an opportunity to work and ask for a favor. Asked Christine, asked Nora, can you put a good word in for me with your husband and maybe find me a position at the bank? So we find it's been about nine or 10 years since they've um, met last met and over time, her life has been very difficult for Christine and uh, Nora's had a very easy life, very sheltered life. And uh, we find out that Christine had no love for her husband. She's not really sad that he's gone. He left her no money, no possessions, no children. She's completely on her own. So we think about freedom and confinement. These can both be negative things. Christine has the negative freedom of being out there on her own and it's very scary and lonely whereas uh, Nora has this confinement she's safe in this uh, nice home but she feels kind of in a sense suffocated or confined and so these two women represent opposites Christine is the um, uh, freedom and Nora is the confinement and yet they're not exactly positive uh, forms of these okay so she, Chris, christine's like wow it's such lucky for me that your husband's a manager he can get me a job and so she goes on and on and on bragging about or happy about her new promote husband's promotion and about their fortune and how everything's great then she starts to feel a little bit bad like i'm so sorry for going on about me Uh, so she says, look, we had to go south for my husband's health, and it was very expensive. Cost us 250 pounds. It's hard to, to imagine what that would be in current money, but uh, cost them a fortune to go down to Italy to save Torvald's life from some type of illness. And so she says, well... Um, she, she claims that she borrowed, she got the money from her dad. Uh, just before her dad died, she says, he gave us the money and we used the money to go and help Torvald get healthy. All right, so she says now to uh, Miss Lynn, is it really true that you did not love your husband? Well, then why did you marry him? And we find out that Mrs. Lynn, because of the limited opportunities for women, uh, she was in a bind. Her mother was alive, but was bedridden and helpless. So she has no father. Her mom's bedridden and helpless. And she has two younger brothers. Somebody has to provide for them. And in that society, the woman could not go really and work and provide for the family. And so she has really no choice but to marry somebody with money so that her brothers and her mother could be taken care of. And then she says, well, now my, more, my poor mother, right? She's dead, she's gone. My brothers have grown and they don't need me anymore. And so I'm all alone. And remember, I talked about freedom and confinement. So Nora thinks, wow, what a relief you must feel. It must be so great to be free and alone. And she says, no, indeed, I only feel my life unspeakably empty. 
no one to live for. It's like when people are married and they see their single friends and they think, oh, it's so great to be single. You can do whatever you want. You can go wherever you want. All that freedom. And then people who are single might look at their married couple friends and think, oh, it's so great to have somebody to, to care for, somebody to love. You don't have to run around, date all kinds of creeps, kiss a lot of frogs. Um, it'd be so nice to settle down and have a relationship. And so sometimes we always admire the other situation, okay? So Miss Lynn says, one must live and so one becomes selfish. So there's a, a negative side to freedom here. When you told me of hap the happy turn of your fortunes, I feel kind of selfish. When I found out that you were rolling in dough and your husband was getting a promotion at the bank, I, I confess all I could really think about was myself. I thought, well, great, that's good news for me because I can now get a job. And Nora says, don't worry, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk to, to my husband and I'll make sure he gives you a job. And Miss Lind is kind of um, um, talking down, she's condescending to, Ms., uh, to Nora. She says, you are a child, Nora. In a lot of ways, she's right. But Nora's got this secret, something that's going on. You think that I'm just a child, but you don't know something's going on. There's something I haven't told you. So don't think that my life is so easy. There's something going on that I have not told you about. So then she starts to give away more of the secret, which was, it was I who saved Torvald's life. It was I who got the money. Well, you couldn't have borrowed it because look, they don't let women borrow money. You would have to sign your husband's uh, signature. Uh, she said, I never said it was borrowed. But notice this, remember when we, when we saw that uh, Torvald said that he would absolutely hate any borrowing or debt? So Nora knows this attitude about her husband. So she has to keep this secret. She has to find a way to get the money, but not tell her husband. So they don't even let him know really what situation he's in. She had to find a way to get the money and cure him without kind of hurting his pride and upsetting him. And so Mrs. Lind is surprised. You've never told your secret to your own husband? And she says, good heavens, no. How could I think so? How could you think so? Sorry. A man who has such strong opinions about these things, and besides how painful and humiliating it would be for Torvald, it would upset our mutual relations. Our happy home would no longer be what it is now. Can you imagine if he found out that his wife had to rescue him? how that would hurt his masculine pride. It would basically ruin our happy home. And so she's trying to, to keep this lie going because she's afraid that the truth will ruin their happiness. Well, do you ever plan on telling him? He says, well, maybe once when I'm no longer so hot, once I'm not pretty anymore and I'm not sexy uh, and all of that wears off, I will tell him and then he'll admire me for my strength of character or whatever, right? So I'm gonna leave something in reserve just in case, she says. And then she says, whenever I get money from Torvald, right? She's been taking all this money and paying back this, this money that she owes. So she hasn't been just wasting all this money on, on stuff. She, it seems like she needs a lot of money because she's trying to find ways to pay back this money without him knowing about it. And notice again, another view about men and women. It says she started doing some side jobs and work to get more money. And she said it felt very good earning money. It was like being a man. See, so a lot of times the women are confined to the home while the men are free to go out and earn a living. And so she said this thrill of like being independent. I could make my own money. It was like being a man, she said. And so now she's all excited. They're going to pay off her last payment. And she says, I'm going to be free from care now. Now, just as she starts to reveal this about this money, in comes the fourth character that we're introduced to in the exposition. And this is uh, Niles Krogstad. And Mrs. Lind has a strange reaction when she sees him. And we find out later it's because Mrs. Lind 
when she was younger, she um, used to date Prague's dad. They were in love with each other, and then something happened. All right. So then Mrs. Lind and Nora start talking about Niles. We find out that um, at one time he was a solicitor's clerk, a law clerk in town. So Mrs. Lind confesses that he used to be in our town and he had a very unhappy marriage. And now his wife is dead and he's left, left with several children. Okay. Now, Dr. Rank is the fifth character that's introduced here. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Dr. Rank later because it seems to be a very odd character and we're not quite sure why he's even here. And I'm going to comment on that in a little bit, right? But through Rank, uh, one role that he plays in the play is that a lot of information that we need as, re as viewers of the play is revealed by Dr. Rank. And so Dr. Rank points out that people feel that Krogstad has a diseased moral character. So Nora's back with her husband and she says, Torvald, I'm sure you'll be able to do something for Christine. And she says, well, it's very light. He says, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll find some work for you to do. Now we're gonna find out in a little bit, this favor that she starts to ask, we're, that, we're getting close to that, enti that, that inciting action, right? That moment that moves us from the exposition to the rising action. It starts the whole conflict that the play is based on, okay? So now Nora is with Krogstad and we start to reveal and understand more about what's going on here. Nora says, what like what are you doing it's not the first of the month yet and he says well we'll talk about that later i'm not here for that reason so it starts we start to get curious what does he mean don't don't talk about the first of the month i'm here for something else what does he mean by that and maybe you you figured it out sooner than i did right um he says i'm getting the sense that mrs lind has asked you for a position at the bank and he goes, yeah, that's right. My husband's going to give her a job. When he says, Mrs. Helmer, you will be so good as to use your influence on my behalf. Uh, I want to make sure that I keep my job at the bank. So um, Krogstad starts to su suspect something. And this is where we get to the inciting action. What, what uh, Torvald Helmer is planning on doing is firing Krogstad and then giving Krogstad's position to Christine. So Nora kind of in some ways plays a role in the crisis because she asks a favor of her husband, please give a job to my friend. And he didn't want, want Krogstad around anyway, so he's gonna fire him. And now Krogstad's asking for a favor. Do whatever you can with your husband to make sure that I keep my job. And she says, I'm not afraid of you any longer. As soon as the new year comes, I shall be very, I'll be free of you. And so we start to piece it together that the, where, where did Nora get the money to save her husband's life? Well, she got the money from Krogstad. And all this time she's been struggling and stressing out and trying to get money. She's been paying all the money back to Krogstad. And she's happy because she has one last payment. The debt will be paid and she will be free and now Krogstad saying, look, if necessary, I'm prepared to fight for my small post in the bank. I'm prepared to fight for this. I'll fight for my life. Look, a long time ago, I was guilty of an indiscretion. My reputation was ruined and I've been working very hard to build up. In a society like this, where people care so much about appearances, your reputation is everything and I lost it. And now I've built it all back and I'm not gonna lose everything a second time. So I'm gonna go out fighting. I'm not, okay? So says, I took to the business that you know of. I had to do something. 
and I don't think I've been one of the worst. Okay, I admit it, I did something wrong. But now I'm finally past all that and I've built up my reputation. And this bank job is an opportunity that I do not want to lose. So he basically says, and she figures it out, you don't mean that you will tell my husband that I owe you the money. And she says, to think of his learning my secret, which has been my joy and pride in such an ugly and clumsy way. So he's threatening to blackmail her. I'll, if you don't uh, keep me, help me keep my job, I'm gonna let your husband know about the money. So he says right out, when your husband was ill, you came to me to borrow 250 pounds. But then he says, it's not just the fact you borrowed money. I want to let you know something. Uh, you needed to have a signature of your father in order to get the money. And they had to put the, the signature and the date. And she's like, okay, so. Well, it's curious that your father signed the loan a few days after he died. Three days after he died, how could he sign his name? So what he's saying is, I know you forged your name. So not only did you borrow the money, but you broke the law, you forged your father's name. So it's not just the fact that you borrowed the money that your husband will find out, it's that you broke the law and forged your name. Think about how your husband will react to that. So he says, didn't you ever occur, did it ever occur to you that when you forged your father's name, you were committing a fraud on me? I assure you that my one false step which lost me all my reputation was nothing more or nothing worse than what you have done. He said, my whole reputation was ruined. People call me, a, they say I've got bad moral character and what I did was no worse than what you did. You forged the name for this money. And he says, he says, well, I only did it to save my husband's life. It was an act of love. And he says, well, the law doesn't care about motives. If you forge the name, it's wrong. And then she says, well, it's very foolish law then. Well, he says, well, foolish or not, it's by the law uh, that you will be judged if I produce this paper in court. So he says, if I lose my position a second time, you shall lose yours with me. And she keeps protesting and saying, well, I did it for love's sake. But um, uh, does that make what she did right, you know? Now, Helmer can uh, pick up on what's going on. He doesn't know exactly the details, but he says, I think that Krogstad has been begging you to help save my his job, right? But he says, there's no reason to lie ab about anything or go behind my back. Look, it's already been settled. I'm, I've already basically fired Krogstad. Right, and we get a little bit of a foreshadowing in Act 2. Uh, coming up in Act 3, we're going to see that there's going to be this fancy ball at the Stenborgs, and that plays a role later, okay, in the exposition. Now, Tora, Nora is um, prying into, trying to get a sense of how her husband feels about things. And she says, was it really something very bad that Krogstad was guilty of? And Helmer goes on, wow, he forged somebody's name. Can you believe it? It's the worst thing. And so as he's talking about how horrible Krogstad is, Nora realizes that what she's done is the same thing. And it's just as bad. So she's getting a sense that if her husband finds out that she did the same thing, then he would be upset. And so he's trying to say, well, maybe he's not that bad of a person. Maybe he had a really good reason for doing what he did. Maybe he was um, doing something for a good reason. And Helmer says, no, he was basically a blackmailer and, a, and a un, um, um, a, an untrustworthy person. He was a deceitful con man. And she says, just think how a guilty man like that has to lie and play the hypocrite with everyone how he has 
I'm sorry, he says that how he has to wear a mask and then think about the children, right? How it corrupts the children and sets a bad example for them. See, all of these comments are being set up and they're going, we're gonna have to remember these when we get to the end of the play. They're all gonna come back. So let's remember this attitude that Helmer's like, look, he's a fraud, he's a terrible reputation, he's an immoral influence on his children, he's terrible, terrible, terrible. And all that atmosphere of lies infects and poisons the whole life of the home. And then he talks about how uh, the mother can affect the, have a, the mother having a terrible influence because we're going to see later that Nora starts to feel guilty and starts to worry about the, the effect that she has on her children. She does not want to be a bad influence on her children. All right. So what is happening in this first act is all of the information about these relationships. He's laying the foundation that the rest of the play will be built on. And uh, Nora finishes off this first act just thinking oh my gosh um i was so close to my dream the the, the last payment was going to be made and i was free and clear but now we have the plot uh, the rising action has started the conflict has been uh, uh incited by the fact that helmer is firing uh krogstad in order to give that position to christine and now Krogstad is going to fight back, okay? Now in act two, we see that um, Nora is so fretful about what's happening. And she's talking to her nurse and she's thinking about what to do. Like she contemplates suicide. She contemplates running away from her family. And she's feeling guilty that last com conversation there at the end of act one, she's thinking about her responsibility and her love for her kids. Now we find out that when Nora was young, she was sort of raised, she didn't have a mother and she was raised by the nurse here. Uh, and so Anne has raised Nora. And so Anne is now doing a lot of the raising of the young children as the nurse. And so she finds out that Anne, well, she knows that Anne had sort of left her own kids to come take this position as a nurse. And she's like, how could you leave your own kids? And Anne says, well, I didn't have any choice, right? We're poor, we have no life. And so to care for my family, I had basically a wicked husband that didn't do anything for me. I had no other choice than, but then to come and work for your family as the nurse. And Anne is like, well, how can you deal with the fact that you uh, abandon your kids? But Anne says, no, um, uh, I still know my kids, right? I still hear about their life and so forth. See, Nora says, I suppose your daughter has quite forgotten you. And she says, no, indeed, she has not. We write to each other. Um, when she got married, I've been following her life. And she says, well, you've been a good mother to me and you're good to my children. Okay, that's, that's Nora's thinking about like, what happens if I die, like commit suicide? What happens if I leave the family? What happens if my husband finds out what I did and kicks me out of the house? I don't wanna be a bad influence on my children. So I want to know that if I'm gone, my kids will be, uh, will, will not, won't hate me. They'll, well, I'll still have a connection to my kids and somebody will be there to take care of them, right? Then we find out Torvald wants her to dress up as a, a, ne a Neapolitan fisher girl and dance this tarantella based on their travels to Italy. All right. We learn some details about Dr. Rank. He has some type of disease called consumption of the spine, whatever that is, right? Some people have suspected that that's tuberculosis of the spine or it's some people say it's syphilis, but uh, it may be some type of reference to maybe uh, moral decay or something in society that is kind of breaking down. Or maybe there's something symbolic about his, um, his illness, this consumption of the spine. And he blames it on his father. There's this kind of view that somehow the father was sleeping around and drinking and gambling, and that because of his behavior, 
uh, this was passed on and now the son, Dr. Rank, is experiencing the effects of his father's bad behavior or something. All right. But we're going to get back to Dr. Rank again in a little bit, right? So Miss Lynn thinks that Nora has gotten the money from Dr. Rank. And she's trying to hint here, like, do you realize that Dr. Rank is in love with you, Nora? He's a rich old dude who's in love with you. Um, it's, I, I get this feeling that you're kind of toying with his feelings and leading him along and that you used him to get his money. And, she, and Christine's like, uh, I think that you've gotten the money from, your, from him. And, and Nora's like, what are you kidding? No, we're, I would never do that. He's a good friend of ours. And uh, I did not get the money from, uh, from, from him. And then she says, besides, he had no money to lend at that time. He got most of his money or he got all his money after that fact. So no, I did not get the money from Dr. Rank. So she says, okay, come on, Nora, you're concealing something. I need to uh, figure out what's going on, right? So Nora now goes to her husband and she's pleading and pleading and pleading. Please do not fire Krogstad. You must save his job. And so he says, I, I mean to dismiss Krogstad. Right? You, you, you don't want me to go back on my word. I'd look, I'd look ridiculous to my staff, right? So I need to make my reputation and I hear he's a good worker. I knew him when we were boys, but because of that, because we know each other, he's always being too intimate with me and expecting things from me. So it's best for me just to get rid of Krogstad and make my life easier and get rid of him. And so that's the end of it. He's gone. Right. So he says, it's too late. And she says, yes, it's too late. Now look at this foreshadowing. I love this. He says, come what will, you may be sure that I shall have the both courage and strength if they, if they be needed. You will see that I am man enough to take everything upon myself. Now that's very important to remember that for later because he says, when we get to a crisis, you will see that I will be a man. I will step up with courage and strength and I will do what needs to be done. So let's see at the end if, if he does that. He says, we'll share it, man and wife. That is how it shall be. And we'll see if he, so he's talking to talk. We'll see later if he walks the walk. All right, now we get to Dr. Rank. And what seems to be the, the, the what's strange is that Dr. Rank is like in the middle of Nora and um, Helmer. Dr. Rank is a good friend with Torvald. They talk all the time. And he's a good friend with Nora. We find out that he's in love with Nora. And Nora shares all of her thoughts and feelings with Dr. Rank. Things that she never says to her husband. So she thinks of Dr. Rank as her best friend. And uh, her husband thinks of Dr. Rank as his best friend. And he, he's coming to this house every day and he's kind of like in the middle of the couple. And so he kind of becomes representative of the distance between the husband and wife. They don't, they're not best friends with each other. They don't talk and share their ideas with one another. They, they um, and so that's in sense how I look at Dr. Rank. He's this character who represents this barrier between the two uh, people between Nora and her husband and she pours out all her thoughts and feelings to rank these are things she, she, she should be telling her husband and he lets her know that he's getting close to death and he says when I'm about ready to die I'll send you a card with a black cross on it and so you'll know you'll come to my deathbed and say goodbye to me but I don't want to bother your husband because he doesn't like death and stuff like that and so it kind of shows how superficial uh, da, the husband is all right. Now, it, it kind of upsets Nora because Dr. Rank shares his true feelings 
and lets him know that her know that he would he loves her and he would do anything for her. He would sacrifice his own life. And she's like, why would you tell me that? And he's like, you didn't you can't pick up on some subtle hints here. You don't know that I'm she's like, yeah, I guess at some level I knew you love me, but you didn't have to come out and say it. Now you're making things awkward. OK. He says, now, Nora, tell me, had you any idea of this? Did you know that I loved you? Right. And she's like, well, I can't really say one way or the other, but, you know, you know, we were just doing so well. Right. And she goes, look, I put you in the friend zone. Just be a good companion and a friend. You didn't have to bring up all these feelings and stuff. Right. And he's like, well, maybe I should just go forever then. No, no. She, she said, don't. You know, he, my husband needs you as a friend. I need you. Stay here with us. So she puts him back in the friend zone. And so she says, look, when I was at home, I love my papa, but I always found it easier to talk to the maids. And so now my husband is like papa and and he goes, oh, I see. So now I've taken the place of the maid. So I can't really share my feelings and talk to my husband. I couldn't do it with my dad. So I talked to the maids. And now I couldn't really talk to my husband. So I'm talking to you instead. He goes, okay, I get the picture now. I've taken the place of the maids. All right. Now, Krogstad finds out that he's being fired. And so he says, look, I don't care how much money that you have. Um, I'm not going to give you the bond of this, right? I'm going to hold on to this information. I'm going to use it for blackmail. I don't care how much money you have. And uh, he says something, he mentioned suicide. He says, you should give up that idea. And she says, how did you know that I had thought of that? She's talking about suicide. And he says, most of us think of that at first. I did too, but I didn't have the courage to go through with it. And she says, well, neither do I. So he has a letter in his pocket that's going to tell him everything about the forgery and all that. And he says, your husband's going to find out. And if you and your husband want to keep everything quiet, you better put me into that bank and give me my position back. So I'm not asking your husband for a penny. I don't want money from you. OK, I'm going to use this letter. I'm going to expose it to your husband. And here's my reason. I want to rehabilitate myself, he says. I want to get on. And in that, your husband must help me. For the last year and a half, I have not had a hand in anything dishonorable. And all that time I have been struggling in most restricted, cir restricted circumstances. I was content to work my way up step by step. And now I am turned out and I'm not going to be satisfied with merely being taken into favor again. I want to get on, I tell you. I want to get into the bank again in a higher position. Your husband must make a place for me. And within a year, I shall be the manager's right hand. It will be Niles Krogstad and not Torvald Helmer who manages the bank. So at some point, I'm going to take your husband's position at the bank. Right? And so this is what's going to happen. Right? So I'm taking that letter and I'm putting it in the mailbox and the truth is going to come out. He says, have you forgotten that it is I who have the keeping of your reputation? And be sure you remember that it is your husband himself who has forced me into such ways as this again. I will never forgive him for that. Look, I don't want to become a black mayor, mailer again. I don't want to go back to the old ways of life that ruined my reputation. But now your husband has forced me back into the same position, and I'm never going to forgive him for that. So he puts the letter in the box and it's a locked box and only, um, uh, only uh, Torvald has the key. 
So there's Nora looking at it and saying, in the letterbox, there it lies, Torvald, Torvald, there is no hope for us now. So the deed has finally been done. The letter has been put in the box and now Nora is just waiting for the inevitable for her husband to figure out what happened, all right? So we're gonna take a look then at the end of the play, the second half of the play in the next video.